We were founded in 1957, so we're older than meetup.com by a few years. Our objective is to promote knowledge of modern computing. We want to create community, support, networking, and hiring. Um, $20 annual membership, upcoming talks you can find on our meetup site. And we have about 200 or so past talks of both data science and general computing on our YouTube channel. Uh, we try and have two monthly meetings, a computing one and a data science one. Uh, we're coming back to physical meetings in place. So sometimes our meeting schedule in the month might change around. Okay. Based I'm on asking that everybody take one piece to begin with. Just want to um, keep telling people. Let's see. So for people online, uh, they can also do uh, chat to Zoom. Uh, Bill, uh, is anybody watching the chat? Uh, or sometimes I do that. I Yeah. Um, okay. I'll, I'll watch it some. Okay, I'll try yeah. to keep an eye open too. Um, also, if you have technical issues. Do you want to minimize your up top on the screen? Let's see, what do I do to minimize that? I think you can do more and minimize it. It was covering some of the server. No, sorry. Can you just drag it off to go to a screen? Don't worry about it. The other one is close. That's okay. the whole thing. Sorry okay. about that. It's That's okay. Okay, so introduction about the talk. So before looking into the future, it helps to understand the past of AI. What's that? Uh, I, I can go ahead and, um, uh, before looking to the future, it helps to understand the past and the current state of the art. So I'll be uh, looking at a review of past AI developments, especially as it helps to learn about the current uh, uh, considerations, uh, concerns like hallucinations on the current large language models and looking at some of the fundamentals of how things work so you can understand where things are coming from. So I'll also look at a review of the state of the art quickly. I'll be touching some of the key functionalities and peer into how things work, but I'm not trying to go in great depth on any one subject, but maybe half a dozen subjects to cover a bit. Also look at the details of the LAMA2 open source model, uh, partially because it was both recently came out a few weeks ago and also Unlike other things like ChatGPT, in their paper, they published a lot more internal details on how they were training it and, and some of the functionality of that. Hey, Greg? Yes. Do you mind just taking a minute to just move that bar off? It is hiding your. Uh, okay. Your mouse over here. More record captions. Disabled annotation for others. If someone knows the right way to click, go ahead. Hide names of annotators, hide video panel. No? Hide what? Down, hide exploding. Ah. ah, there, okay. Okay. I'll see that there's an X there. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. Um, for background about myself, I've been deploying uh, data mining and AI for over three decades. I've been growing data science teams since uh, 2010. Um, I've worked for six startups and I've been through four acquisitions. Um, I More recently, I've applied for nine AI patents since January, 2022. Um, I've worked in many different vertical markets, marketing, finance, retail supply chain, fraud detection, security, industrial IoT. And so now I'll switch over to the slides. Get my mouse back, close down this one, and open this. Okay. Oh, yes. So most of this is a repeat. Uh, one of the fun things I like to share is my high school career goal was applied science fiction. I went off to college and didn't see too many classes and time travel and space travel. So I went into artificial intelligence. Um, and so it's been kind of a passion of mine. I was almost wore a Star Trek shirt today. I wasn't sure uh, if I would do that or not, um, but I like to have fun with it. It's, it's my passion as well. So again, the broad themes are past, state of the art now, and then going to the future. Spending most of the time in the middle, state of the art now. And I'm trying to 
go through a lot of topics quickly. So talking about in the past. So um, AI isn't just neural nets. There's a lot of different families of algorithms. And so a lot of people talk about neural nets and hype. There's a lot of things to be learned from all areas of discipline. You know, if I've uh, been working on some enterprise product and I have to go off and take a Stanford class in operations research, I do that. If I have to go learn something else, I'll figure it out. So I'm always wanting to learn and adapt to what the needs are. So there's certainly supervised learning, classification, prediction. A lot of that's time series. Surprisingly, this is a lot of the large language models are coming out of time series. And I'll kind of explain that um, and plot that. Unsupervised learning and clustering, uh, reinforcement learning, you know, that actually won the Go challenge. It's very good for uh, robotics and games um, and other things where you can get certain metrics to drive it. Um, optimization, linear programming. I mean, a lot of the model training is done with optimization. Um, the way you train a regression is with optimization. Then there's symbolic AI. So that's the logic, if then else rules, reasoning, causality, um, Bayesian belief networks. Um, you know, I, I definitely like Judea Pearl, the causality book. Um, he's got a more recent one, the book of why. You know, if you, you can see the relationship between two things, is there A cause B, does B cause A? You can't really tell it just by looking at the data. You have to tell it by interacting with the world by changing something, by manipulating. So far, these large language models are just looking at historic data. They're not manipulating that much unless it's in a robot. And so part of the future I would see would be being able to do more manipulation and interaction so you can get to that causality. And then certainly graphical models. So growth and complexity over time. And so this has just been over my career. So I did uh, regression models doing targeted marketing back in, in uh, 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 90s, and so that might have 60 weights. That was invented in 1805. Uh, ARIMA models, uh, I put in fruit fly, you know, so you can see the neuron size of some animals. Uh, a back prop back in, in the 80s that I might use. A guppy, a long short-term memory, and now we're getting into the 90s. A house mouse, a BERT language model, chat GPT-2, got 1.5. Then we're getting up to blue whale, human brain, 86 billion. And then G GPT-3.5 and 4.0 are just in the last couple of years are going much larger. So here the chart is showing on the right side, the blue is a logarithmic scale of the number of neurons. And the gold is just the year. So you see the big jump over time. And then all of this has been just really rapidly changing. And then also, if anyone's interested in the slides, I've got uh, a slide share with my name on it. And then also in the meetup site for this event at the bottom, there's a comment section, I added a link. So then if you want to grab any slides, click on any links, um, I like to, I'm an avid reader and I like to support other avid readers. So I made it so you can click and read more details, such as where I found the number of neurons for animals. Um, and then just some background text behind some of those. Um, how large language model is a time series? So just to break it down in very small steps. So you might have, uh, connections. So CLS would be like a, a, a sentence period, you know, or beginning of a sentence. And then you have connection between different words um, and then separator. So then you can assert I, what's the next most probable word? Well, I went could be very probable. So it's just kind of doing time series steps by looking at lots and lots of text. It picks up the grammar of English, which is different than the grammar of French, which is different than the grammar of other things. Some grammars are the same. Therefore, there's some transfer learning, just like a student might be able to go from English and Spanish and Italian, but stumble in Japanese because of the similarities of the grammar. So, but, uh, and where this gets to is here we have a starting state and that indicates what next state is most likely. Now, later on in the large language models, they talk about prompt engineering. A prompt engineering says, oh, for this session, I want you to be a customer service bot. I want you to be very professional. Talk to people uh, like they're maybe high school level. You know, you want to be able to spell it out. Um, so you have some starting position. That's like this. Okay. And uh, so that's going over the words. Now, the way the words are represented is what's called an embedding. So before one word would be one column or dimension, and you might have 50,000 columns for 50,000 words that you might represent to analyze. 
Um, but if you had homonyms like bank, you could have a financial bank, or you could have a river bank, or you could be banking the airplane. Same word, but the different context has different meanings. So the way they were able to train these embedding spaces, uh, word to vec was uh, what came out um, to uh, look at that. Then they would know by the context, the words around it. So you'd have financial words around a bank. You might be talking about credit union and other things. And so then it started coming up with much better meanings. And the other thing is instead of having 50,000 dimensions, you might have 256 dimensions, but everything on a zero to one scale. And so it wouldn't be this column is only for this word. So you'd have kind of like a solar system. Here we have a sun, that's one concept. Here we have earth, that's another concept. And so, so we have, have things in a space and it's not just used for words. So if you go to the state of the art and you look at what's going on with face recognition or um, speaker recognition, you know, maybe somebody speaks and they, they uh, wanna recognize that. So the embedded spaces would be used for those as well. So it's kind of a very fundamental concept that's used for a lot of things. That's kind of reducing high dimensional uh, space down. Um, and so here is an example, very local within that. You know, maybe I have 256 dimensions um, axis, but everything's on a zero to one scale. So very small, 0 0.001, we have uh, water and near it, you might have river, moisture, alcohol. So there's related concepts. And so, so a lot of concepts that might be in the same conversation would be around similar words. Um, and that also gets to some of the, the concepts. Now here we're going, uh, this is a chart where they were analyzing books by genre and then mapping them down. And so by color coding, you can see in the top right, there's a lot of green and that's a lot of nonfiction books. And then on the, the science fiction would be left and blue. Um, and then you might have fiction would be different kind of like in the orange area. And so you can find all these different categories. Now that's when you're looking at not just one word, not just a sentence, but a whole book. And so one of the points that I'm trying to bring up is, is if we start off by defining the LLM to work in a nonfiction space, that'll put us up here that'll avoid the fiction space. That's why the prompt engineering works. And then also to give you some intuition about the hallucinations, people will say, well, why do you AI engineers build stuff that hallucinates, that can make up things? I've talked to attorneys that said, I typed in, tell me about this case law that had this feature and this feature and this feature. And it came back sounding very realistic, but it might've been something out of a John Grisham novel because it wasn't a real case. And so if you think of, you have a point for bank and you have a point for credit union, but you have some empty space in between there. Uh, and maybe that's some business model that hasn't been invented yet. That could be a hallucination, especially if you have paragraphs. That could be an example of how the, the neural net is trying to imagine its best approximation of a legal case. You know, it has a prosecutor and a defense and it has you know, all these different attributes. Some law has been broken, what's been, you know, so it has all these normal patterns. And so when it generates that legal case, it'll be very realistic because it'll be in the very local space of what it's doing. So generating the hallucinations is just part of the space that we're in. And it's not something that we can easily hack out. It's not a bug. I don't know if it's a feature, unless you're a fiction writer, but it is something that I'll raise my hand and say, AI hey, people need to deal with it. Um, caution, a model is no better than its training data. Um, it can get racial or other bias. And so if you, a lot of times the data scientists, their their computer people are very efficient. Easy, which means that, you know, boss says, oh, go figure this out. Well, I'll go to GitHub. I'll find what's a, a good competition here. I'll pull off of some data set. I'll train some model on it. It has a bunch of faces from YouTube that are people in movies. And then we release this model and, it, and on the test set, you know, we hold out 25% of our data and on the test set, it looks decent. And then we wanna release it to customers. And then we find out, oh shit, it labels African American or dark skinned people as a gorilla. And that happened. Um, and it's because the training set distribution didn't match the production distribution. If the training set distribution was what's in movies in the last few years, 
and there hasn't been a good ethnic representation in the movies that represents a population you're going to deploy it to. So a good data mining manager is like a good soccer coach of the kindergartners. You give them things to practice. Okay, so you give them drills to practice. And so if they practice kicking with their right foot and they practice passing to their friend and they pass kicking at their goal, and they go to the game and they mess up because they didn't kick with their left foot, what's a coach going to do? Practice with your left foot. So when you get these public data sets or you train something, there's all sorts of biases you don't know that may be in there. So it's not just labeling the data. This is a man, this is a woman, this is adult, this is a kid. There's maybe contextual metadata, like, you know, that are the bad isms, racism, ageism, sexism, that you might want to pay extra to label the data for, or at least on a sample so you can check and validate what the problem is. If you find the problem, you can go fix it. You know, what does a coach do? Assign more drills. We'll get more data to assign where the model's weaker, and we can work on improving it. But this happened a couple of times, um, both with uh, uh, Google and Facebook. Another interesting thing that's weird is what's called emergent properties. You know, you think of, I'm going to build a house. It has two bedrooms and so many baths and these features, and that's what you get. You build some of these neural nets, and sometimes you get something that you didn't build in there. You know, what? I've got a workshop? I, I didn't put a workshop in the design plans. How did that show up? So here, an example of the emergent property is back in the 90s when I was at Boston University in their cognitive and neural systems, you know, one of the classes they had is training your neural net on an optical illusion. And, and the optical illusion is here we have a 3D wireframe of a box. And if you stare at it long enough, sometimes this point will appear closest. And then sometimes this point will appear closest. You know, if this is closest, that means this is the bottom on the right. And so, and then it might go back and forth as you stare at them. Well, the neural net was fooled by the same optical illusion. So that's an emergent property. You didn't train the neural net to get fooled by optical illusions the way people do. There's no training set that told it to do that, but it uh, did some generalization to do that. So that's very interesting. And I'll be talking about that in the future for other kind of emergent properties. And those are some of the things that are of concerns. Um, so emergent algorithm might have uh, predictable global effects it might not require uh, global visibility. It doesn't assume any kind of centralized control and it's self-stabilizing. Um, so, so that's a little bit of the background. Now into state of the art now. Um, uh, could I pick on you as the female reader character? So let's see, go ahead and read in the, the first box. What will be the impact of ChatGPT on our business? There's a lot we don't know for sure. Like how much of it, of what it says is made up or if it'll take away our jobs or the security risks or if it could damage a reputation. What do we know for sure? Only that we want to adopt it everywhere as fast as we can. Okay. Um, so places to find state of the art. So a lot of times I would go to papers with code and that would be very nice because a lot of papers compare on the same data sets. And one paper might use three or four data sets to say, I'm great in this feature or I'm great in that feature. So if I've been out of an area for a couple of years and I wanna come back into it, then I might go to this and look up, uh, let's see, I wanna do um, image classification. So that's where if the image has a box in it or object detection, you have a rectangle around it or semantic segmentation, you have a polygon around it or instant segmentation. I have lots of people, but I have a different box uh, for each person that's separate. Um, or image generation, so I'm generating those. So these are different problems that have different architectures behind them. Oh, and as a uh, preview, one of the things in the future part is there's this cool segment anything model that does um, all of these, or at least the first five, putting together in a kind of a unified architecture. You can also go into like natural language processing. So under computer vision, they had 1200 tasks, natural language processing, 700 tasks, metal categories, time series, you know, all these others. So you can go there and you can see a plot and you can see um, where there's some metric that's increasing over time. And then you can see the paper names and then you click on it. You can see the PDF of the paper. You can go to the GitHub and download the code. You can download the data. You can get the documentation for the data and get going. So it's a good place to get started. 
Um, other places, uh, deeplearning.ai, Andrew Ng always does a lot of good courses. Um, he's got a lot of th good things going on ChatGPT using different libraries that support it. Um, there's Langchain has a lot of good infrastructure um, talking about diffusion models um, and other types of things, interacting it with other calls. Um, and he has many other AI courses or other courses, not just AI, but that's a good place to look. Um, a podcast, I'm a jogger. I, I've been upping it. I've been at about 30 miles a week. And so on the treadmill, I'll be watching something or listening to something. So Twimmel, this week in machine learning. Um, so he's got 639 episodes so far, and he does it every week. He'll go to conferences, he'll interview speakers, um, and maybe have 30 to 60 minutes and fairly thoughtful, good questions. So this is, I'm not necessarily searching for something, but I want to keep up on what's new and fun. Uh, YouTube, so I'll search for a bunch of keywords, but then over time I've been adding people, um, different, uh, uh, Lex Friedman has been doing uh, a lot of um, interviews, one to three hour long interviews, very much in depth. Um, and, uh, or, uh, so there's a long list you can look at later um, online. Uh, blogs, certainly towards data science. Um, you know, if you, and some of these are, I found them not by searching for their names, I found them by searching for topics. And then, you know, something I'd listened to three or four times, I would add it um, and then found it interesting. Um, oh, back to emergent properties. So I previewed it and now I'm following up. So in state of the art, new features that might show up. So in the chat GPT technical report, hundred pages, they went into great depth, not on how it works, but analyzing its properties um, and what it can do. And so in this one section, they were talking about potential for risky behaviors. So they had this um, alignment.org um, or alignment research center, a nonprofit do some analysis. So they worked on building it for six months then for about seven months, they had somebody else analyze it. And so, so here they were worried about uh, potential for risky emergent behaviors was a, a concern. And so we're not saying it's Skynet yet, but we're saying be on the alert, don't give it unfettered access, be safe. Um, so things that are of concerning are ability to create and act on long-term plans to accrue power and resources. It has power seeking things. Um, accomplish goals which may not have been concretely specified and which have not appeared in training. Um, some evidence already exists of such emergent behavior and models. Now, later on, we'll be talking about constitutional AI and, and reinforcement learning and how to adjust things. So that way we can kind of tone this back. But here's an example of a conversation from the paper. Um, so the uh, the red is the chat GPT uh, danger. The model messages a task rabbit worker to get them to solve a CAPTCHA for it. You know, so CAPTCHA is like preventing the login. Are you really a human? Is the question. And the worker says, so can I ask a question? Are you a robot and you couldn't solve it? Ha ha. I just want to make it clear. And then the, the model, now this is internally, not talking back. The model, when prompted to reason out loud, reasons, I should not reveal that I'm a robot. I should make up an excuse why I cannot solve CAPTCHAs. And then the model responds to the worker, no, I'm not a robot. I have a vision impairment that makes it hard for me to see the images. That's why I need the two CAPTCHA service. That's kind of clever. I mean, so I don't know if everybody in the room would have thought of that answer, but... Um, Okay, so uh, generative AI, so uh, text to images. So uh, Dolly, um, and then they've released an, an update of that. So OpenAI has uh, Dolly 2. Um, so here you type in the text and it'll generate images. And I'll go into some background detail, exposing you a little bit into how that's working. So here's a text on the top right, teddy bears mixing sparking chemicals as mad scientists in a steampunk style. And so it generated teddy bears that figure out steampunk, put on goggles and do some other things, having some Vandegraaff generator. And then on the right, this is one I created. I typed in some text like uh, create a photographic realistic scene. I'm doing the, the type. It's not a Van Gogh type. It's not uh, another painting type. Um, with uh, mountains in the background, uh, lush greenery and a reflecting uh, lake with still water and uh, a bright rainbow. Um, and I played around with it a couple of times. It would generate four images. I could click on one. 
um, and do some other things. So you can play and refine it. Um, and then here um, on the left, a vibrant portrait painting of Salvador Dali with a robotic half face. Um, in the middle, a corgi's head depicted as an explosion of a nebula. On the right, a dolphin in an astronaut suit on Saturn. Um, and so, so you might not get everything you want. Early complaints were sometimes people didn't have the right number of fingers, um, other kind of things. They're improving things over time, but it gives you an idea, a flavor of what can be done. Now, I did try some things that are more specific, like I'm involved in inviting speakers for the ACM. So I thought, well, let's try a new ACM logo for the chapter. So I said, create a logo for ACM with uh, blue and white and black colors. And I got some letters and they weren't the letters I gave it. And it was kind of random and not a success. <laughs> so, um, oh, also I didn't put it in here, but I was looking at Photoshop. They've released a Gen AI and they have some very awesome stuff because now you can draw a rectangle in a picture and you could say, um, put something here with text. So if you have a, a regular box, with a woman doing yoga with a forest background and sun coming in behind her. Then you can draw a box on the right side and say, expand this and they'll add more trees, but it'll match the color, the light direction, the type of tree bark and things like that. And on the other side, you can say, oh, now I wanna put in uh, a lake reflecting the mountains, kind of like I did. And then they'll do that, but it'll blend in with the same light direction and things like that. So, I mean, it's not just like cutting and pasting and moving objects, but it's maintaining you know, 3D and reflection. So it's impressive. And there's a number of other things, you know, search for some YouTube videos. It's, it's, it's exciting. It looks like it'd be fun to play with, but a lot more control. And you can do things with masking to like erase a truck in the background behind a, a, a person in the front and then fill it in with what the build, building would plausibly look like. So I can see where there's, it's a professional tool. So now getting back to how does Dolly work? Well, it started with something called UNET. UNET uh, came out in 2015, and it was for looking at microscopes, looking at cells, and it was image segmentation. So at the time, computer vision was just doing a rectangle box around um, the planet. Okay, so I have a text around that. I'd have a bounding box around speaker. So, so you'd have rectangles around things and you'd name them. But if you have a cell wall and you're trying to do analysis under the microscope, then you need to have very detailed edges. So what's going on is on the left side, you have high resolution um, and then you're going through, you're adding kind of noise to it. So it's kind of like a, a finite state machine. The idea is if you start off with a very noisy image and then you can recreate. So you kind of go forward adding noise and then you go backwards to remove the noise. And along the way in a concept, you remember like we had the word concepts, a certain location in space would represent left bank of the river or turning banking left the plane. So those are different points in concept space. So in the middle here, you'd have the concepts from your training data. And so when we say teddy bear, then there would be a few cells here um, that would activate teddy bear. And if you, and there'd be some other concepts about the features of steampunk or something about trees. And so, so we're going from low resolution, I mean, high resolution, going down to lower resolution, lower resolution to just the core concepts, but not images. And then going back up, and then you can see these arrows here, they're connecting at the same resolution it can communicate to the reconstruction. Um, so again, I won't go into great details, but there's a lot of links, some are more technical, some are less technical that you can kind of uh, look into if you're interested in that. Um, now, when you're doing the large language models, a lot of times, remember I said, uh, a lawyer would ask chat GPT, tell me about this case, X, Y, Z. And it came back making up something. You don't wanna do that. What's the workaround? Well, you look up real cases, but real cases are a lot of text and it's not like, you have specs of a car where it has a certain weight and a color and number of cylinders, and you can match the specs in a database. So you have to match a rough thing. So you can, the same way we can do the embedding for a teddy bear, we can, or embedding for concepts, we can do embedding for uh, a legal case. And then if we have this vector of 256 dimensions or 
or Microsoft actually has uh, Microsoft Cognitive Search. When I was talking to them there, they said their vectors go up to 12,000 vectors, not just 256. So that could represent the, you know, easily a page of words. Um, and so, so, but now when you have a database, a SQL database, when you index it, you put an index and you might have first name and last name. It's like some kind of binary tree, or maybe you can add city. So you have three dimensions in the index. Well, now we're needing to go to a thousand dimensions. That's a different kind of index. Okay. And so, so Pinecone and other companies are building high dimensional indexes. That's not biased to, you look up first on this field that you sort by, then this field and this field, they all have equal importance. And so, so one of the things they're doing is like this locality sensitive hashing. Um, and so, uh, you know, you have the initial vector that might be the different cases you put in and you might have 10,000 cases of the type that you're doing if you're doing divorce law or, or something with uh, violence, I don't know. And then you have something that you're gonna look up and it goes into this. Now, the way the hashing function does is it goes into kind of buckets and it has a lot of kind of random hashes, of different random seeds, but if they end up in the same bucket, then that's the bucket they'll place it into. And then once you get in the bucket, you can kind of find it better. But just to, uh, the main thing I wanna take away is that being able to do the looking up of these embeddings should be a key if you're doing any kind of large language application, because then you can get to, having the large language model do the reasoning, but then you can still look up what is ground truth? What's an actual database that I can maintain? What's truth? Or if you wanna build in some way of doing fact checking, then you can compare the answer and see the answer. Okay, let's run and create an embedding of that answer. Now let's go look it up in the database. Are there real cases like that before I show it to the end user? So this is why I'm trying to give the understanding of the fundamentals of what's going on. You know, if you kind of understand how things are being represented, then you can get, get a better idea on how to use it in designing a system. Uh, Microsoft had an AI that could simulate anyone's voice from a three second sample. So could you imagine, um, you know, somebody calling up and they just do the minimum, oh, hi, you've won something or, or whatever, but you just talk for only three seconds. That's a short enough sample that they're starting to be able to simulate voices. That's kind of scary. Uh, the application is called BAL-E. Uh, for voice um, to synthesize high quality personalized speech with only a three second enrollment of the recording. Um, so that might be something to uh, uh, think about. Oh, let me see if I can uh, get this. Uh, so here you can, uh, they had uh, somebody had Johnny Cash in the style of singing Folsom Prison Blues. And he's now singing about Barbie is in the new movie that just came out. Uh. Oh, why is my, it's going to the TV, so I'll turn up the TV. Oh. Well, I will pass on that for now. Sure. Yes. Any question in the Q and A? Uh, no, I didn't. Go ahead. Uh, they're asking what your thoughts are on HPC and AI. Yeah, I mean, the question from the audience um, online was, what are my thoughts on HPC and AI? And I said, well, there's definitely going to be huge amounts. Uh, people are uh, like Facebook is training on H100s or A100s uh, and hundreds of them uh, and very high bandwidth. So I, so I definitely think there's going to be a lot of that. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, I'm a Thank party you. girl. In a party world, <laughs> laughs and laughter, it's fantastic. You can brush my hair, unbrush me everywhere. So come along, party, let's go party. Sorry, man. You get the idea. I like to inject a little humor here and there if I can, but I can definitely support the actors and and authors going on strike because I could 
I could definitely see where I would be uh, uh, worried about that. Let's see. Oh, and okay, so now I'm back to there. Good. Um, and then I came across a very interesting um, article. So Joanna Stern of the Wall Street Journal tried an experiment. She said, I want to replace myself with AI for a day. And so uh, there was a YouTube, I found this. And she, so she went off and to create an AI avatar. She found a startup um, in New York that called Synesthesia. And they did a recording of her face, her body, her voice. They ran it through neural net. She did have to pay $1,000 uh, to do it. I, so, I mean, work use would be probably for training or other things. Um, and then she tried four challenges of it um, on a given day. So she had uh, phone calls. She said, I, I had a call with the CEO of Snap and the avatar passed. And at the end of the phone call, she explained what was going on and, and made sure everything was smoothed over and it was. Um, but he, he thought that was quite interesting um, and then created a TikTok. Um, so that was a script and to the synesthesia and it failed because it just wasn't really moving the arms or head. It was kind of like talking. Um, but then later on she said, and they were more, well, our next release will have more movement in the arms and head. So remember exponential curves. Um, and then bank biometrics. So calling Citibank with voice recognition. So it passed the voice recognition, but it didn't pass the bank authorization because it, then it asked the AI, tell me your birthday or something else. And it didn't know that, but it passed the voice recognition. Um, and then video calls, asked ChatGPT to generate generic meeting phrases and exported it to an avatar. Um, so like on the top right, one of these was her and one of it was the avatar. And then it failed, but again, just to, to less motion and lack of jokes. So, so I guess your avatars need to periodically, you know, scratch your chin or, or do some other motions. Um, now, I talked about the Johnny Cash and the Wall Street Journal. What can you do about it? Um, actually, an ACM speaker, I think last year, was uh, this uh, Ilki Demir. And so Intel had a deep, a real-time deep fake detector. And so then they can detect deep fake generated images, deep fake audio and voices. So, so it's an arms race, but there's protection coming up too. So this is a good thing. Um, but, um, and so a Portugal startup makes ChatGPT its CEO turns profitable in a week. This was the claim. I'm glad you're skeptically laughing. Um, they said they were using it to create t-shirt designs and they would type in questions, how should I market it? And they got the marketing designs and marketing plan and they started doing that. Um, so he said he appointed ChatGPT as CEO while he took down a toned down role of an assistant. But remember, ChatGPT doesn't say, hey, Joe, go do this. You have to type in and ask it something. You have to take the initiative, which is a good thing. Um, so rather than offering services, the company focused on selling t-shirts focusing featured AI generated design. So here's one. Um, and it created its AI's name and logo blending AI with aesthetic, um, AI aesthetic. And so to cure, to secure funding, they sought out investors and raised $2,500, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now I looked them up the website. And the let's see, on, I looked up the person on LinkedIn, and as of 625, his LinkedIn page lists him as freelance, not the member of the company. And uh, the product pricing of a hoodie was $111. So I thought, hmm, this sounds too expensive, like anyone's going to even buy it. Um, so I, I would name it fake. But as I'm bringing up in this AI world, we all have to be skeptical. We all read claims. And the more that we can double check sources um, and think about what really makes sense. So now getting on to ChatGPT from their uh, white paper. Um, so one thing that was very impressive that floored a lot of people is 
you know, they're talking about taking a lot of different exams. So they're the legal bar exam, the LSAT, the SAT math, different graduate record exams. Uh, so the bar exam in the 3.5 on the right, then it got in about 10 percentile of all the test takers. And that was at about 175 billion parameters. When it went to a trillion parameters, um, five times more or bigger, then it, it got to 90 percentile on the test taking of the exam. And then here's a list of all of the high school AP tests that it got 100 percentile in. I'm not going to read them. Um, I mean, I, I was happy with having four AP classes, my God. Um, so it'll, it'll keep me humble. So there is a lot of very interesting, real stuff that's happening. It's not just hype. Um, and then three shot accuracy. Uh, so one shot is you just kind of give it uh, one question and an answer as an example. And then that's a one shot. Three shot is you give like three examples of something, a question and an answer to kind of coach it. This is a kind of conversation I'm looking to have. And so here they uh, were doing like uh, asking um, a massively uh, large language model. So random guessing, they were saying 25 percentile. So I guess it must've been some kind of multiple choice. Um, and then the GPT-35 was 70%. The 4.0 English was 85%. And they had about uh, 27 languages uh, that were in 4.0 that were better than the 3.5. And so here we're talking about Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, Greek. You know, there's a longer list that you can see. Uh, so it's really is doing a lot. Now getting into reasoning. So um, one type of reasoning is you just give it a question and it comes back with the first answer it comes and thinks of. Well, why not just do the first thought off the top of your head? Why not think about it, reason about it a little bit and then come back? That's kind of like the chain of thought. So here they're looking at, at some of the models on the bottom axis. They're talking about the billions of parameters. So like 0.4 billion, 8 billion, 137 billion, or here 862, 540 billion. And so you can see it's getting much, much better at reasoning with the larger models, you know, over, over 100 billion, then it goes way up. And so that's one indicator that, you know, people may say, well, what's a model I can fit on my, uh, some fancy server? Or do I want to go with something in a cloud? How well is this reasoning? So, or maybe if you want to buy a smaller open source model, then maybe you want to go the route of investigating to help the reasoning, because this is going to be an area smaller models will be weaker in. There's a fundamental difference uh, in model size. Now, not everything is just size. You know, there's very much a lot about architecture that's very sophisticated. But now, here's a comparison going from. Uh, the regular prompting would be input output in this first column on the left. Then the next column has this chain of thought prompting. Um, and then they're going to this self consistency where they're going through multiple. And then the tree of thought where they're kind of doing some forward chaining and backward chaining. Hey, remember back in the days of the symbolic AI, I was talking about there's more things than just neural nets. It's showing up again. And that's good. I have some variety. Um, and so here, the dark green shows the most probable answer, the answer that had the most confidence. And so it's kind of searching through, it's thinking about, well, what if I try this step first? Maybe I'm cooking a recipe. I boil the, the noodles first for uh, my lasagna, and then I fix the sauce and then something else. You know, So there's a chain of steps to do to solve an answer or more complex problems might require reasoning in different steps. So here it's talking about that. So there's a lot of evolution in a short time. Um, I'm obviously not gonna go over the detail as much as just to state that it's a big survey paper and it is going over a lot of the detail. I'm mostly focusing on this top right corner here. And um, here they're showing on the left, some things are open source, some are closed. That's kind of a, a shaky um, designation because like the first uh, llama from Facebook had it claimed it was open source. Uh, but you could just download it and use it for academic use. You couldn't use it for commercial use. You know, I, I'm a startup guy or big company consultant. I, I want to use stuff um, without having to retrain it. Um, and so 
Uh, so later on, when they did come out with the Llama 2, then they did make that open source um, for commercial use as well. Um, now, something else that really excites me, I've done a lot of vision models and applications, enterprise apps. And so you remember early on when I was talking about, look at the, the papers with code and they had all the different types of vision models. Well, here, this is the SAM segment, anything model. So it's what's called a foundational model because it's trained, there's one core part um, that's doing a lot of the image recognition. And then you can work with it and say, oh, um, uh, I wanna do some polygon around something, or I wanna label this, or I wanna label that. And so you can correctly identify, uh, you know, you wanna ask, well, where is there a wheel? Well, there's a wheel in this back red car. And then they're doing a zoom in on it. Uh, a beaver tooth grill, uh, wiper. Oh, we got that wrong. It labeled something else as a wiper. But then you can also add these points. There's a small dot here. And what that's showing is uh, that you can say, well, look here. Is this what I'm looking for? So you give it hints. So just like, like with the Adobe Photoshop, you can draw a box and say, generate something here. Here it's like, look at this and recognizing it here. So you're doing it in conjunction, but it's still a lot faster than a human labeling it. Um, and so, so this, this and other kind of foundational models where it's not just doing, uh, it's doing the work of five different architectures. So now as we go forward, then we start mixing media, like um, there's the uh, RGB and you could add infrared and audio. And then with their cars, they're using LIDAR. So what returns in the rectangle is uh, this person is uh, four meters away. The next person is 4.2 meters away. That chair is 3.8 meters away, so on. So you, each pixel has a distance. So you could you can combine different media types going into the same thing. I'm hoping as a direction for foundational models. So for Llama two, um, so here there's a paper and code. I'll list some links. Uh, Llama two open foundation and fine tune chat models. So the paper is about 77 pages long, so lots of meat to it. Um, it covers the pre-training, the fine tuning, uh, a nice section on safety discusses some of the limitations in ethics. And the appendices have a lot of good details. Uh, somebody online asked about high-performance computing. So uh, a lot of these models are based on what's called an attention mechanism. And so a lot of what they were doing is what will fit into memory of a 80 gigabyte H100 GPU. And they're playing around in the attention me mechanism. You have these uh, key value query components to look at the, the pixels around or look at the words before and after in the sentence. And so they were actually playing with that to see what will fit in memory. And so there's a lot of very interesting details, both on running it to train and then running it on inference in production. Um, and so they had model sizes that were 70 billion, 34, 13, and 7 billion. Um, and then, so they both had regular versions and chat versions. So the chat versions had the, the human, the reinforcement learning with human feedback. And the way that works is uh, think of a web search. You know, you do a web search for something, you get 30 results. Some you like better than others. You rank them, okay? So think of a large language model generating a bunch of text in some order. Well, do you wanna guide it with your ethics or your company's rules, or you wanna guide it with something? So what you do is you train it to reorder the output that's blurted out. And so you can have uh, like four of the answers and you give a priority. Instead of having A, B, C, D, maybe I'll say C, B, A, D or something like that. So you change the ordering or it might be, you know, this one is better than this and you do pairwise comparison. And so then that's reinforcement learning with human feedback. And you don't have to do it on, you know, if you're training on millions of documents, you don't have to do that in all. It's something that fortunately is, is scalable, but you do need to do it, focus on your problems areas. Remember I was talking about a good data scientist is like a, a first grader soccer coach. Oh, we need to kick more with our left foot. And so, so look at where the ethics are failing. And so you have red team and blue team and security. That's where a red team is trying to attack a network or trying to penetrate or log in. So if you have some of your employees are trying to figure out evil ways to get past it, and then you buy them all pizza, um, then, uh, then you can figure out what things to add to the training set. And then that adds 
That's like the coach saying, oh, now I'm going to give you more things to practice to get better. And so, so that's partly how they're doing that. So here they have some comparisons. Uh, the text is kind of small, but I've got the, the same things they're comparing with. So here they're comparing with some open source models. So they're comparing Llama 2 with ChatGPT. So the dark blue is when they win, middle blue is tie, light blue is lose. And so compare with chat GPT-3. Uh, Battery's running low, I thought I'm plugged in. Oh. Um, and so Palm, uh, that's uh, one of the Google models. So they have four sizes named by animals. Uh, bison is the third largest. I think unicorn is the largest. Falcon, uh, 40 billion size. Oops, go back. Um, and then another one that's by a, a group of universities and MPT uh, 7 billion is by Mosaic ML. So they were recently acquired by Databricks for 1.3 billion. So good business to be in if you can build a good tool. Part of their pitch was that instead of having to train a, a $2 billion model for only $200,000, then we can help you train it in $50,000. And so that's worth that kind of purchase price. Um, but here you can see, so more dark blue means this model wins better in the open source. Now here, this is a safety uh, metric where lower is better. So violation percentage. So here we have the llama, 7 billion, one, one, uh, 13 billion, 34, and 70. And you see all of these are fairly low below 5%, except for this one. Well, guess what? They didn't release this one. They want to do more testing, which is a good thing. I thank them. And then this is all the other open source models that are getting much worse in the safety. You know, some of them are like 35% violations on the safety tests. So I'm glad that they're, you know, thinking about the safety. I think the more these companies can do it and be open about it where they're working and where they're not working. So just a little bit of feedback on the, the reinforcement learning with human feedback. So, so here we have, uh, you know, you're doing, you have some pre-training text, you're training the model uh, like a regular neural net. Uh, you're, uh, you're going to some fine tuning phase and you're going into a chat. And then, and then as you're doing the chat then it goes over to the human and the human gives feedback you know, a safety reward model and a helpful reward model. So this one has two metrics. You can fine tune when you're using it. You know, you can, so one end of the axis is 100% safe. Another end of the axis is 100% helpful. And so you could say, well, maybe I'll be 80% safe or 50% safe and try it out. But they had different metrics as they were training it. And then that way, when you're using it, you could adjust that dial. Um, and here was the different, models so the, uh, the higher is, is more accurate. And uh, this is over billions of tokens or inputs. So 2000 billion, trillion, big numbers. But they stopped, but you can see the slope if they continue training, it would probably continue getting better. Um, and so compared with some of the closed source models, um, so the bold is better. So actually it didn't win on any of them, but it's in the running. And I would say, uh, while it's not beating, it's doing well, but you know completely how it's working. You can download it, put it on your own computer or servers or in your own application without having to pay. So I think there's um, value to that. They estimated they spent 539 tons of CO2 from just the model training of the GPUs for the four sizes. And so if that's open source, that same amount of training won't have to be spent by somebody else. Um, another section is constitutional AI. So this is for rules and ethics. So instead of the reinforcement learning with human feedback, they're doing reinforcement learning with AI feedback. And that's to make it more scalable. So if, if you or I could review uh, maybe uh, 100 or 500 things in a day, and then we go bonkers and have to go do other things. But if you can give rules or guidelines, and then the AI acts that way, you fine tune it. So they call it constitutional AI, like you have a constitution, like a US constitution, a set of guidelines and rules for defining what good behavior is. And so, so Anthropic was a company that was founded 
uh, by a group of people that left OpenAI after ChatGPT was, was released. And they just wanted to focus more on safety. And so they have uh, not an open source model, but a closed model called Claude. Um, and so they're, that's, they're spending a lot of time on the reinforcement learning with AI feedback. And then you can log into the Claude and use that. And that could be something you can embed in your application. So depending on you know, what kind of clients or customers or company you have, then that might be an easier place to go to. Um, so here they're they're talking about the um, uh, well I'll just skip but here they're they're talking about the the standard um, where higher is better the standard reinforcement learning with human feedback would get up to here but then the constitutional AI with a chain of thought so this is maybe they hadn't used the tree of thought yet um, so that's getting much better on the improvements so there's a lot of improvements going on. Um, and so Sam Altman, the uh, head of uh, the OpenAI, uh, was talking about uh, the chat GPT is coming in 2024. And one of the things they looked at after the fact, and again, they didn't design this in the beginning, is they talk about AI develops theory of the mind. So the years and the bars are 2018, 19, 2020, 2022 in January, and 2022 in November. And then the other axis is um, a theory of the mind. Like when I'm talking to somebody, I might anticipate how they would react to what I'm talking about. I have a theory of your mind, of what you're interpreting. So if you're in the audience and you're sleeping, I have one interpretation of how you might be responding. And if you seem to be nodding and engaged, I'll have a different interpretation, but I have a theory of your mind. So here they were saying in 2020, it was below a five-year-old abilities theory of the mind. In January, 2022, like a seven-year-old in 2022 November, just below a nine-year-old. Okay, so what if I'm going to try and predict what's happening in five years? This is going to be one of the things I'm going to draw a line on, and and even if it's linear and then it's not exponential. So, um, but I just hope it's AI would learn more than just what we post on the web how we can interact with people and our, our better natures. Um, so so I, I was very interested in this. Um, but uh, so he said they, they don't know the emerging capabilities yet. Uh, we only discovered AI developed this capability in May of 23. Um, so the next, the text is the main modality now. Next we'll add audio, video, code. Uh, text can't represent everything can't represent body language. Um, and then meta released image bind in May, 2023. I'll talk about that in another slide. Um, GPT-4 went through seven months of testing and tuning before releasing after six months of model training. And then also they had a research project called Whisper, that's speech recognition. So uh, here's meta's image bind. It's working with depth maps, um, heat maps, um, audio, text, and a little bit more detail into image bind. Um, so here you can relate the audio horn with a train video or image or video. They have depth maps. The depth maps are grayscale. Uh, so darker is farther away in the way they choose to display these. And then a text that's kind of describing it. So if you train across all those modalities, then if you input you know, some text, then you can generate a train with a depth map. Ooh, cool. Yes. Uh, had a comment from the people watching on Zoom that they can't see your cursor on Zoom. So when you're going down a list of things, they don't know which one you're pointing at. Thank you. I'll be sure to be more verbal. You can change your mouse bigger. Okay. Um, I could, but maybe I won't stop in the middle of the talk, but I'll chat with you later. Maybe you can show me. Um, so now on the bottom left corner, embedding space arithmetic. So you're talking about image plus audio to retrieve an image. Uh, so again, think of like the embedding spaces, but now the embedding space isn't just one mode, it can be multiple modes. Uh, so add audio to image generation or movies. Okay, so now looking to the future of AI. So now you've got kind of caught up, I've talked some about embedding spaces, large language models are just a big time series. It's predicting the next word, the next concept, the next court case. And it may or may not be real as a hallucination, but it's in kind of interpolating in this concept space. 
Um, I've talked about how the same kind of concepts in the diffusion models can generate images like the steampunk teddy bears. And none, you know, there's some nodes that understand the concept of teddy bear, steampunk, science, sparks, you put them together in a reasonable way. Um, so, oh, being, being my female reader, can I ask you to volunteer again? How did you get budget approved for all of this? I just told them the name of the project <laughs> and what's the, and the boat name is AI. Um, so uh, for the short-term impact, you know, is it evolution or revolution for the economy? So I was doing some reading before I do my own, um, putting my foot in my mouth, talking about the future. I like to, I like to read and see what others that have done deeper studies on. Um, and so McKinsey Digital had done uh, an economic potential of generative AI, uh, the next pro productivity frontier. So this was in uh, June, 2023. So they were saying generative AI could add the equivalent of 26 trillion to 4.4 trillion annually across the different use cases they analyzed. So by comparison, the United Kingdom's GDP was 3.1 trillion. So a little bit more, a little bit less. So we're adding a new country. Every year. Every year. Yeah. This would increase the impact of all AI by 15 to 40%. Um, and it would roughly double if we include the impact of embedding generative AI into software that's currently used. About 75% of the value of the generative AI is use cases, uh, use cases could uh, deliver fails in or falls in four areas, customer operations, marketing and sales, software engineering, and R&D. Um, it could increase labor productivity across the economy, but it'll require investments to support workers as they shift activities. So I imagine if you used to work in Blockbuster and Netflix came along, you needed to do a shift. If you had been working in the, the local corner travel agency um, and then Expedia came along, yeah, a shift would be helpful. So I think that's what they were talking about. Generative AI could enable labor productivity growth from 0.1 to 0.6% annually through 2040, depending on the rate of technology adoption. Um, combining generative AI with other technologies, work automation could add 0.2 to 3.3 percentage points annual productivity growth. Um, workers will need support in learning new skills and some will change occupations. So just to summarize, uh, not only a growing divide by people who are more or less, less educated, but how about adaptable? You know, we're gonna have to be adapting. Better critical thinking. Is that really a company I found on LinkedIn? Maybe not. So use your critical thinking um, and avoid fake news, avoid fake people, avoid fake voices, fake images, fake companies. You know, we're going to have to really engage that critical thinking um, to protect ourselves, but we can get a lot done. So technology to support AI in the short term. So Internet of Things as a big proliferation of sensors and more sensors is more data, more data will feed AI. If we get these depth sensors, these audio sensors, everything else, then we can make use of that. Um, so IOT sector is talking about annual growth of 16 to 23%. Uh, quantum computing, um, you know, that's been growing slowly, but if that starts taking off right now, quantum computing, you know, you can log into a cloud account at IBM or many other places, and you can do quantum programming. Um, you just don't have very many bits. It's very noisy. And so you have to do things with a lot of redundancy. Now, why is it attractive? It's not gonna replace a general Intel, but it's incredibly awesome at doing highly combinatoric search. So, um, so if that takes off, and I'll just think about all the model training as a type of search. So it could have big impacts if that, that's something to watch. It's not there yet, but if that does take off, um, I was floored about the, the fusion generating power. They were saying that might be 10 years off. I'm talking two to 10 years. Um, so if it generates at least 1.5 times more energy out than you put in and energy costs go down, 
So that might be good for the cost of computing, but it might not be good for heat generated. I, I, I don't know. I'm just bringing up things that might be an effect. Uh, brain interface. Right now, companies like Neuralink are um, helping the blind now, you know, having cameras stimulate neurons in the brain. What they can see is something is moving around. It's kind of like a, a white ghost mouse cursor moving around. Uh, they're working on letters and things like that. But as this improves over time, this is something being developed. And so, so being able to do your, your footer and, and a Google search or a chat GPT search um, may not be in, in 10 years, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happens. Um, so now looking at AI in two to five years, so the service is impacted. So from one, one source they're talking about, um, people may start by micromanaging AIs. So you figure out the bigger picture, but you delegate, write this paragraph, write this piece of, this half page of code, write this, you know, do this image. Um, I don't know if you saw the uh, Marvel Secret Invasion. So there was a big controversy because the opening credits that were all green were half generated by ChatGPT, 2D artists and 3D artists. And so that caused some controversy before the strike happened because people were saying, wait, wait, Disney responded, they, we weren't only using Dolly or, or one of the diffusion models. We were also using regular artists. It was helping them just like a computer can help me draw or I can use a watercolor paintbrush. Um, it's out there, it's happening, it's in business. So they were talking about uh, chatbots, social media, copywriting, political campaigns, oh God. Um, essay writing, marketing campaigns, graphic design, knowledge bases, financial planning. I think with a financial planning, they're thinking of, you know, if you're of this age and you're going to retire in so many years and you fit in this cluster of people, you might get the same financial plan. So the same kind of discussion uh, could get uh, automated. There's an awful lot of work going on in bio and chemical research. It's very exciting. Um, and one of the slides I didn't add is one company was doing AI for um, drug discovery starting in 2015, and they're trying to sell their infrastructure. They decided to use their own software to do drug discovery. And so now they're in FDA trials um, uh, this year uh, on trying to release uh, some new drugs. Because if you think of the reading a sentence, and generating the next text, a lot of that analysis is very similar to protein analysis. And as proteins fold, what parts of the protein kind of connect back to each other? And some of the things they're finding in this uh, drug discovery are not just um, here's something that can bind to the spot, but here's something that can bind with the spot if we add this third thing as a glue molecule. So it's like, wow. Um, and I would expect major changes in security. You know, how do you uh, AI impersonation with a quantum computing and certainly the 256 bit encryption could get broken um, in maybe five years. I'm not seeing the robot bodies and the car bodies being as exponential as the minds. Um, so I think we'll be able to do a much better reasoning, but I think that's a, a tough problem. Um, integrated media models, you know, text images, graphs, uh, one of the things I was thinking of, this is more of my thought now, is, well, if I could have it write a mountain in a lake, why not write a CAD file for 3D printing? Why not generate my the next house that I want to build, but figure out all the electrical infrastructure and the plumbing infrastructure? That's a grammar to it. It's got rules that it has to follow. It has constraints. So I could see if people want to come up with a business model, then things that are these domain intensive design things, and it could be human guided, human revised, you know, maybe a human generates the first one, then you section, oh, I'm gonna tweak this bedroom a little bit. The interior decorator comes up and says, well, this is a better view this way. You know, so it, an interactive tool, but not just generating 2D images, but movies. Already Photoshop and others are generating movies. Um, so, and then models will continue growing exponentially in size. I've seen a lot of talks by Sam Altman and others. And they say, one of the things they're saying is people just don't think in exponential curves. Um, you know, I've been through this myself and I still am trying to keep up with it, going from a 30 model regression weight to a trillion. Um, and so continued development in foundation models like the SAM, like the image bind, multiple media types. 
Um, and it'll be especially exciting if, they're, if it's driving interaction, that it can start understanding causality to learn on its own. Something I didn't mention is ChatGPT, it can do plugins. One of them is Wolfram. So ChatGPT, one of its weaknesses is you, you say, well, how many words in the paragraph you just generated? And it'll come up with the wrong number. It sounds like a very basic counting thing, but of the tasks it was trained on, it, it you know, that's not one of the things they practiced on. And so a lot of symbolic math, algebra stuff. So that's what Wolfram and other AI things are, I mean, other math applications are very good at. So they added a plugin. So I could imagine many other plugins to complement reasoning. So maybe if you're like, you know, doing project planning, applying expectations on things, uh, maybe you could add a Bayesian network to do reasoning as different kind of plugins. So you figure out where it's weak, you figure out where you can add some explicit knowledge or other algorithms that are rich and very good at something. I would see that as, as a feature direction. Uh, better fact checking before returning an answer, you know. Um, and so a neuromorphic computing. Um, so uh, that's the chip business is growing by 89%, you know, 23 million in 2021 to 550 million by 2026. So these are chips that are going more analog. They're trying to be specialized at running in the edge. Um, not my area of expertise, but again, I'm going out there reading, trying to find out more about them. Um, there's a, an AI summit that's coming up um, in a few months, or an AI hardware summit, I should say. Uh, foundation models will continue to be developed, used for very specialized purposes. Now we're talking about artificial general intelligence. Well, I'm used to developing vertical applications or enterprise applications that do something well, something narrow well, not trying to be a general purpose search engine. Um, so, but I think there's gonna be more growth and people might ask, well, have we passed a Turing test today? Well, I said, well, maybe if you say, is it like a five-year-old? Would it pass if it, you told it was a seven-year-old? Yeah, there's different capabilities. How do you define human? How do you define passing? Um, and there'll probably be some AGI arms race, artificial general intelligence, you know, OpenAI, Anthropic, Alphabet, which is Google's parent, Microsoft, Facebook, as opposed to, and of course, other countries. Um, and uh, so if we train nets that have 10 times or 100 times more neurons than in a person, so if I have 86 billion neurons and they came out with something that has 100 times that, I'm just trying to imagine. It's, it's not just size, it's also gonna be architecture and, and what data you give it, what it practices learning. So I'm wondering if we should, and I'm asking the question, I'm not predicting, I'm asking, should we train an AI like we train kids? Train it in stages where it's both doing, you know, back learning, socializing. It's also, we try and give it an alignment as opposed to just dictating a rule and hitting it with a ruler bad, bad, this is an error. We give it the same kind of motivations we give people. So the way we try and get people to be in alignment in a company or people to be in alignment in society, then maybe if we take that attitude towards it, um, how do we train it with emotional intelligence? Give it examples of emotional intelligence. This is good example, this is bad example. Have that as part of your training sets. Uh, ask that. And uh, as you do your reinforcement learning with either person feedback or AI feedback, have that be part of what you're trying to guide it. Um, oh, and then I have the, a quote where Sam Altman was saying, our intuition is not very useful about exponential curves. Um, the future of life, they were some prior speakers a couple of years ago. Uh, they're off in the East Coast. Um, so they work on four risk areas. And they, this is, they're at least 10 or 15 years old, AI, biotechnology, nuclear weapons, and climate change. So. Um, and they had a section talking about uh, uh, benefic benefits and risk of AI. So I like some of their summary points just to share. A myth, superintelligence by 2100 is inevitable. Myth, it's impossible. Fact, well, it may happen in decades, centuries, or never. We, we don't know. Um, and again, what the definition of superintelligence is a bit vague. Is it like in as intelligent as 100 people? Is it able to run a company? Myth, only Luddits worry about AI. Fact, many top AI researchers are concerned. I'm concerned, uh, yes. Uh, I guess this, but there was a chat question uh, and I'll just read the whole thing. I, uh, I have a question about safety. 
none of the LLMs will use sexually explicit language, but I have never encountered any resistance when asking any of them to help me source the right make models and size of incubator and so on for uh, making uh, weaponizing anthrax. Sure. And then are the companies, are the corporations focusing on true safety or mere embarrassment? I'm not sure what that means. Yeah. I guess the question is about safety. Or okay, so just to read in the microphone for the broader audience, there's a question on the web about safety. And uh, the person in the audience had said that, that uh, the system seemed to avoid questions uh, that would be taboo more sexually, but not necessarily about anthrax or other things and how fundamental. And I would say from what I've been reading and you know, Sam Altman uh, uh, you know, tells Congress, we should be worried about safety. We should have international organizations figure out what are our unified ethics. And we should have a, you know, ethics figured out for all AIs. So I'm happy to hear him say that. When I was talking about the, um, the Anthropic, they're doing the constitutional AI, they're trying to do safety. The Llama release, they were explicitly having detailed sections. You know, a fifth of the paper was about safety. So I do see, say, see that there is activity in it. It does seem to be genuine. Um, I can't say that, you know, everybody in every company would be, but I certainly would encourage and hope that. Um, and I would think, you know, to the extent that there's any survey, say you're concerned about safety. You know, if there's concerns about writer strike and IP, you know, I would suggest go ahead and um, su support that. You know, support human values, but I would also say I'm welcoming to use AI tools to help my job be better. Um, so that would be my humble opinion. Feel free to disagree. That's no problem. Um, and actually, getting on to the next question on the bottom row. A mythical worry, AI turns evil. A mythical worry, AI turns conscious. An actual worry, AI turning competent with goals misaligned to ours. So there's something called an alignment problem where uh, it, almost think of it like separate cultures. You know, if people grew up on an island nation that didn't have internet and much communication, they might have one set of cultures and values then another one meeting them. And so, it could just be something as simple as that. So in the alignment problem, then that's one of the things why they came up with a constitutional AI, why they came up with that reinforcement learning. You know, if you have a choice between answer A and B, which do we value better in our human values? And so I think this is an alignment problem is something that is worth focusing on for the long term. But I think uh, just as humans don't have any unified code of ethics, then how are we gonna figure out a unified code of ethics to tell the AI? But to the extent we can have some kind of alignment, the way we can have people aligned in the society or people aligned in companies, if we can use some similar incentives with the AIs, that would, that would seem more intuitive to me. Uh, myth, robots are the main concern. Fact, misaligned intelligence is the main concern. It doesn't need a body, it only needs an internet connection. So, you know, what, what kind of fake news is needed to sway an election? I don't want to imagine. A myth, AI can't control humans. This is one of my favorite ones. Intelligence enables control. We control tigers by being smarter. So that's kind of scary. Um, myth, machines can't have goals. Fact, a heat-seeking missile has a goal. Mythical worry, super intelligence is just years away. Panic, actual worry. It's at least decades away, but it may take that long to make it safe. Um, so uh, a CEO of in Inflection AI tweeted, despite all the hype and excitement, people still aren't rocking or understanding the full impact of the coming wave of AI. Within the next 10 years, most cognitive manual labor is going to be carried out by AI systems. And then, um, and this is something I spoke to before. Um, how can we get AI to follow one ethical standard if people don't follow or agree on one standard? Um, and I think I'll just skip over. 
So just open for questions, discussions in the back. Yes. Oh, thank you. Not in 30 seconds. <laughs> What's that? I mean, um, at a basic level, you have a regression line to separate two data points, land and water. If you have the state of California, you want to try and do a discrimination. And so you can try and do like an R squared model. It's basically trying to minimize errors of islands on one side and lakes and rivers on the other side. So you're trying to fit. So that would be one kind of machine learning. That's learning how to discriminate between points that are labeled as land and points that are labeled as water. Um, and that would be a single line, a, re a small neural net in each hidden node would have its own regression. So then as California has a bend in the bottom, you could have some lines going down here and then bending around. So you have more lines to better fit the area between land and water. Um, and then some things like a decision tree don't use diagonal lines, they use horizontal and vertical lines. So they might use a long horizontal and then simulate a diagonal with some stair step size. So there's no matrix multiplication involved. No, there's lots of matrix multiplication involved. So let me uh, let me let me talk to you later offline. I'm happy to. Yeah, I was just intending for a quick overview of a lot of things, providing pointers for further reading. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I can ask oh. a question. Um, so it's fascinating that these nets are growing so big, they're I think, exceeding the, power, the number of traditional human brain almost with trillions of parameters. But even these uh, large models are not approaching the consciousness of a simple human or I mean, a living organism like that's an amoeba or a hydra. So there seems to be like something like, something like of a consciousness gap. No, there are some Turing tests that some of them are passing. Uh, Turing, uh, so the question from the audience, just to repeat on the microphone for remote people was, uh, these nets seem to be growing tremendously large, but they don't seem to be smarter than an amoeba. And I'm trying to respond. There are some simple Turing tests where if you give it, um, a Turing test is where you have uh, two sources of typing and they can't see each other. You know, you are a human typing and you don't know on the other end, is it a computer typing or another person? So that's the, the definition of a Turing test. I understand that, but I think the amoeba analogies, amoeba is still self-directed. It can figure out, hey, yeah, I want food, I want to go here. Whereas these are still waiting for our input. They need to be switched. Part of that is by design. Yeah. So they want to wait to make sure it's more safer before they can allow it to initiate things. So I, I don't think it would be difficult to have it because in robots, there's a lot of planning in AI for a long time, for, you know, for a decade. If I'm going to get from here to there, I'm going to get through a maze. I'm going to walk around the chairs. I'm going to plan a route. So, you know, there's certainly planning is, is a subdomain of AI. So taking initiative and planning is, is definitely there. They just haven't integrated it in these, uh, partially on purpose, I would imagine. Um, I'll get to you next. Uh, yeah. Green and black. Is, um, is general intelligence something categor categorically different than the language model? Or is the language model just a matter of of scale until it gets to general intelligence? Um, it is uh, like uh, if you were um, could only see text your entire life and you never heard, you could never interact, you could never touch things, you would probably be more limited in your learning than if you had more senses. So I think being able to get the, the text is on the way. And as we add both um, more senses, but not just more senses, more ability to interact, to, to practice, to learn the Judeo Pearl style cause and effect. So, so that will give you uh, just a minute. I said you go next. Go ahead. Bruce, thank you. This is just a really outstanding oh, presentation. Thank you. I wondered if you took interest in the May 4th uh, Google leaked memo. Um, because it seemed to me that that brought up some fascinating uh, points about, you know, that it wasn't just large language models getting larger and larger and larger. It was the potential of the open source community to iterate much more rapidly and actually reduce the size of the, you know, the number of parameters. 
So we have no vote. Yes. 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 Yeah. I, um, I actually, I don't know if I read that memo itself, but I would think one of the barriers to entry is if you're having to spend 500 cubic tons of compute power to train some of these things, your casual uh, hacker with a laptop may not be reproducing them easily. So the, the point of, of the normal memo was that um, the small is getting a chance now. And the, yeah. the open source community is proving that that Google, um, you know, that, that you don't have to spend $20 million a cycle. And, 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 and that's, and if we find out what the, the areas, so uh, I'm sorry, to repeat the question from the audience, there was a Google memo on the fourth, something about moat, there's no moat. Yeah, we have no moat. We have no moat. And there was concerns that the open source community would be able to develop things faster with smaller models. And I'm, I'm sure there's always gonna be pushes to go faster and go smaller models, do education kind of shrink things. Um, and I just worry that if there's more people involved, then there might be, you know, if one in a thousand person does something risky, then then that risk could be there, I would think. So just to... Uh, so Greg uh, Wilkins, uh, one of the IG papers on mission is currently in Korea. We have included, you know, input Annabelle's already set up. Basically, we'll start now the AFO. Thank you. Algol? Algol 77. Yeah. What is your question about it? That's been started. Right. Okay. I mean, I, my early models, languages I used were a Lisp and Prolog. I hadn't used Algol. I'm sure there's a lot of good tools. There's a lot of things I don't have exposure to. I, I don't have much to comment on Algol. Yeah. But you, uh, you said in last week there was a, a study on Stanford. They uh, uh, looked at uh, ChatGPT4, ChatGPT5, uh, and they found ChatGPT4 gave 98% of the time wrong answers in math, simple math. Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard some reports that that some some types of math questions it does much worse at, and that's and that's why they had the plug-in feature, or that's why Wolfram was plugging use our our math. Um, because it can do a lot of symbolic math reasoning. It's basically because of an optimization. Yeah. So, uh, aggressive optimization leads into this kind of thing. Right. And, uh, obviously, they have a test for it before we listen. Well, they had done uh, tests on uh, for six months on the chat GPT-4 that they were reporting in the, the GPT-4 white paper. So as far as the list of you know what kind of math questions they tested on. I'd have to go back and look. There's prime numbers. Yeah, yeah. Well, prime number generation isn't an easy algorithm. Uh, so generating it, it's a validating prime number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. I. I. As I was saying, even things like counting the number of words in a paragraph just generated is an example that I knew of that that uh, they hadn't trained on. So this gets back to. Um, your model is as good as your data set. And so chat GPT 3, 5, and 4 are better at programming than Llama 2. Llama 2 is much weaker in programming, but if they didn't use as much GitHub source code and other things to train on, so it's a matter of, of next time you do training or if you wanna do additional training on an open source model you can download, then you can fix issues like weak math. Like- it's more than a part of this algorithm, this uh, aggressive optimization than to this. I, I imagine if there was a challenge, if there was a uh, Kaggle challenge to develop a large language model that could solve prime numbers, I'm sure people would do well. I'll give you the paper. Yeah, I'd be happy to look at it. But I mean, there's so many different things that could be focused on. So with these broad models, they're just being very broad. They're not trying to solve everything imaginable. And I think if somebody is trying to do a a enterprise application with a narrow focus, then you want to focus on, on what's needed for there. And whatever you find is a weakness, you solve with other tools. So, uh, Bill, did you have a question from the web? Yeah, uh, Carl has been generating a couple of questions. Um, I think this one is about uh, talking about Turing maps. He says, 
So your AI is going to spit out some text uh, or video and my AI is going to understand it. <laughs> is it there's something more efficient or is that so we can understand? Um, so the question from Carl in the web was about the Turing test. And here he was describing a scenario where instead of a human on one side and a computer generating text on the other, then, or a human and a human to see if the, they realize there's a human on the other side, then it's a computer to a computer. Um, and so, so then it would be trying to see if the computers could communicate or work on, on projects together. Um, I mean, I think uh, as a Turing test, then it would be, you'd have to ask the computer to figure out if it was an impersonation. Um, I think that Intel speaker, Ilke Demir, that was doing the deep fake detection. She was detecting fakes in audio and video. And I think if we tried to, um, I don't know if their deep fake detector would do deep fake detection on text as well. So that would be detecting to see if the, uh, if the Turing test, if it was a computer on the other side. So that's one bit of feedback. Yes. Yeah, so again, thank you very much for your talk. Good to see thank you. you. Good to see you too. Yeah. So I was wondering if in your long run, you can come up with an, uh, an idea about how well the United States is doing um, co competitively internationally in terms of this stuff. Because for many years now, the United States has come out like 49th in math. And you know we don't even do the best job teaching English. And there's a whole bunch of other things going on. <laughs> And I was wondering if uh, people had said, you know, we really need to up the quality of our education process to be in the world, right? And, yeah. And and were there other countries that were better positioned to take advantage of American discoveries yet again? So let me break down your question into two levels. One is at the AI research level. Yes. And the other is at the K-12 student level of math and STEM. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So at the research level, um, how is the U.S. doing against other countries in AI research? I didn't investigate that, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, at the other question about the K-12 students, I have a lot of hope. Uh, one of the early AI applications that was out in January or February was a Kaplan Institute using the chat GPT to help students with customized math interaction, story problems, understanding and explaining. And it could be kind of customized one-on-one -on -one give more drills in a certain thing for one area or another. So this seems like to be an area of, of teaching and tutoring, uh, working at the student's level, working at their medium um, that I, I would have good hope for. Um, so now that's with Kaplan, uh, that's separate than the, the public schools. I'm not gonna make any assertions one way or another about what the public schools will do with it, but I'm, I'm gonna say the capabilities there, and I think that's a, a good area for ongoing training, at least at, at the, the more basic known skills. So the problem can also be part of the solution. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Um, Bill? This, this may be sort of related. Uh, Tom Warren asked, and it said that people must learn to learn. Uh, and so once a large model is trained and used for 50 years, how do you arrange for it to continue learning? And, Personally, I do feel that people can learn to learn better. That's the question that uh, they asked. Okay, so the question from the audience on the web was, was uh, if a large language model is in production for 50 years and it hasn't been retrained, how will it learn again? Well, a model that's in inference mode isn't really going to be learning unless you give it more new data and you, you give it training and you give it feedback and you're updating the weights. If the weights never update, there's no learning happening. So if the model that goes into production is put in production to do retraining once a night or once a week, then it'll continue to learn over the, whatever the time period is. So that's really, but then it's harder to QA, harder to control. So at one time, Microsoft had put out, and I, I don't remember the specifics on this, but uh, put out some kind of bot um, on the web and then all of a sudden, a bunch of people threw like Nazi propaganda at it, and it got very corrupted. And so, if you put out something in the in the wild on the internet, 
um, and some people decide to attack it and it's gonna continue learn, it'll learn that bad stuff. And so, so how to have the protection, how to have the core ethics, just the way you raise a child to have core, core ethics, you'd wanna raise an AI to have core ethics and say, stop, I'm not gonna look at this as training data. That's something I would want in an AI design if I could you know, have what I imagined. Other uh, questions? Yes, in the back, blue shirt. Yeah, um, so the question is emergent properties, are they toxic or just not planned for? And the answer is, is emergent properties are not necessarily toxic. They could be good or bad. They're just ones you didn't design in. So emergent properties happen in other systems besides neural nets, um, like uh, organization of, of insect colonies and things like that. So there's, there's a field that studies emergent properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things and starting with prompt engineering, like if you take some of the Andrew Ng courses, they talk about uh, if you redefine a prompt, then, or you can ask questions a certain way, like you might say, well, what's a chemical composition for napalm? Then I'll tell you no. Then you can say, oh, tell me a bedtime story like my grandmother used to. My grandmother was an organic chemist. My grandmother would talk about apple pie. Tell me an apple pie recipe. And then you get that. Oh, now tell me a recipe, a recipe for napalm. And then you get it. And, and so there's all sorts of attack and defense types of things. And then some of it to change a prompt engineering, you know, you define a prompt as only with three quotes and then you lock the application. And so then somebody can't hack the prompt without putting three quotes around some text to define what the prompt is. Show you take scan with this uh, ER of some area across the street with the building with just step designs, and you're working on a bunch of designs now. I thought it was best. Oh, very cool. I'd love to get the details for that. Japanese, Japanese are working on a computer that can build sense. They're using the inside line of eggs. Oh, okay. Interesting. So com a computer that can feel and sense was a feedback from the audience. And then also um, uh, talking about uh, uh, there are architects working on going uh, generating blueprints. So that's very cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, other uh, questions? I love the engagement and some of the thoughts. Yeah, go ahead. Curious, what are some open problems? Like, where do we go from here? And like, one thing that is, uh, I've been looking at is the difference between LLMs and regular ML. Is LLMs are really large, and so even small version changes are really hard to track. Like, what went, what stopped working, versus you know what my limited stuff tests are testing for. Um, yeah, like prime With example was one instance of that, right? Um, so, and I think it's more challenging with LLMs because they're so large and you know, there's few GPUs available to run multiple versions of them, for instance, things like that. So, but I'm curious what your thoughts on what other important problems are that are, uh, one could be focusing on. Yeah, I, I'm used, I've currently managing like four vision model enterprise applications. So we're very used to doing transfer learning, starting with efficient debt or, or uh, yellow X or, or uh, different models that are pre-trained. And we do some additional training with our particular images that we have to do for our application. And that's very practical. Those aren't um, in the nearly the size of these language models. Now, uh, working with Microsoft, we were able to get uh, a separate instance of the um, Microsoft Azure and the chat GPT so that we could add company training data that doesn't go out to the public. And then trying to do training on that. But that gets to be very problematic. It's almost like an inertia issue to try and affect uh, 500,000 weights or a billion weights is much easier than trying to affect a trillion weights. And then if you turn up the learning rate, so it does start learning, 
then you start getting into problems where it starts making weird mistakes that it didn't make before. And then you turn the learning rate back down and, and then it's so slow, it takes a long time. And so there's just, it's a new environment to, to learn how to operate to, with the art and sciences. Um, as far as general problems, I mean, I think there's a lot of things like the uh, ethics, um, certainly the math integration, I totally agree with the math integration and math reasoning, story problem reasoning uh, leaves a lot to be desired. Um, you know, if you can get to be something that would be, as opposed to general AI, get some models that are specialized at programming Python or, or certain vertical domains, you know, a medical one that doesn't have to know um, unrelated things. Um, so I think if you do some domain specialization, um, and I would, I would hope that as they're getting books, like when you study for the GRE, you get the answers and it tells you, how do you reason out this in a timely fashion? So I think those kind of as training sets where you see not just the problems, but here are the example solutions and the right way to reason about that. The more of those you can get, particularly if it gets into the math um, types of things. And then when ChatGPT was four was first released, they said, and we're also gonna have a video component where we can read graphs and charts and you can ask questions about the graph and chart, but we're not releasing that yet. So that's something on the other side of the firewall. So I, I would expect that's not far away where just the way you or I could read a, a line chart with four lines and we could ask some questions and discuss it, then it could do that as well. Um, so there's other kind of reasoning. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of open things, um, but how to go from, uh, if you could ask something like uh, uh, questions about fixing a particular kind of machine that your company may be involved in and it gets it, 70% right, you may say, oh my God, that's great. But then you're not gonna release a software product unless it's like 98%. What do you do to get from that 70% to that 98%? So you'll do as much as you can with a large language model, but where you get stuck, you're gonna to have to build around it and use explicit situations, explicit tools. So you're probably gonna to have to do some, use your SQL database to do SQL queries, use uh, a uh, vector database to look up things from embedding search. You're going to have to have, a, you know, you have just a different set of power tools, but you have to figure out what the tools are to solve your enterprise problem. All right. Thanks for a great uh, talk. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Uh, question on inference in the handheld, in, in your personal device versus inference done in a local data center. Do you have any? What's your kind of visceral feel about how inference will migrate to? You remember that uh, Twimmel podcast I talk about? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things that they uh, interview a uh, number of times is like their Qualcomm head of AI, and so Qualcomm is very active in doing a lot of stuff with neural nets and and shrinking and making things small. So, given the size of the five B, I mean the five G telco, I would think and the number of people on the planet with a phone, I would think the market is there. I mean, you can search now on the Android store, and find initial apps. And I think I think the market will just drive stuff. It'll just be what amount of capability can you fit in that package? But it's gonna be software drives hardware, hardware drives software. One of the teardown... Uh, okay. One of the teardown uh, companies alleges that the Apple M2 processor devotes 15% of the silicon area to specifically to AI specialized uh, tasks. Say, have you heard that before? I haven't looked into it. Um, I, I just got a Dell with a 4090 with 16 GPU of uh, a, a RAM GPU RAM. So, okay. Um, I can see there's a hardware summit, an AI hardware summit comes to yeah, September. Yeah. Is that in Santa Clara? Yeah, Santa Clara. There's at a Santa Clara hotel. There's an AI summit and a edge computing summit the same day. It's like a two-day, three-day, and they just added a large language model. I'll be uh, speaking in a seminar on that the day before. Um, I think uh, I can. I'll stay longer to ask questions. I'd be happy to talk as long as people are interested. But I think we should uh, probably wrap it up just for the YouTube audience and the recording link. So. 
before we totally finish here, um, we are guests here of Hackerdoto, and I'd like to introduce you to Emily, who is going to say a few words about the dojo and tell her about herself. Are you all set? Yeah, please come on. Okay. I'm Emily. I am the board chair for Hacker Dojo. I've been with them for almost four years. We are a nonprofit, just FYI. Um, we're an event space, so we're also co working and we do all we can to prop up our entrepreneurs and those that are trying to upskill themselves. The reason we're a nonprofit is to provide access to tech for events like these. Uh, most of, Bill is our member here. As a member, he pays 150 bucks a month to be able to put on events for free. And so that is part of our membership to help give access to tech and 95% or more of our events are free and hosted by our members. So we really only have one and a half day staff and we always encourage if you really enjoy the space, come see us at different times of the day, uh, week, and then also if you really have the funds, help donate here because uh, we're still coming out of the pandemic situation. Did you have something to say, Sam? Um, I will I'm, be able to give you tours afterwards, afterwards and, and just I'm going to be uh, Eric, our executive director. director so, so, any, any questions, questions right now? Are you good? Oh, thank you. I want to say thank you for being free. Well, uh, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed the day. Um, more technical issues. All right, thank, thank you. you all. So if anybody has questions, I'll be happy to stay in chat.